Hi, I'm Tom Tobin, the sector head here at Hedge. I'm the demography uh, group here. And a recent issue, we're going to host today the uh, About Everything segment. Uh, we've already done several of these. I'm sitting in for Dan Holland. I'm excited to hear what you're going to talk about in these slides about birth and death and the mortality and some of these uh, other interesting slides here. So take it away, Neil. Great. Uh, thanks, Tom. I, uh, uh, yeah, this was a significant event uh, that came out, I don't know, about a week ago. Uh, this was the uh, uh, National Vital Statistics System, which is part of the uh, uh, CDC. And uh, very anomalous finding. This is their preliminary uh, data uh, review for uh, 2015. Uh, which showed e either one of those was anomalous, but for the two to happen together is very anomalous. Namely that the mortality rate actually rose last year and the fertility rate sank, both of which went again expectations, uh, against expectations. Uh, the mortality rate was surprising, as, as we know, and we have some charts in there if you want to look at our piece. Um, in recent decades, mortality goes down almost every year. We have public health improvements, medical technology, all the rest. Uh, occasionally, we do have anomalous years where the total uh, mortality rate, age-adjusted mortality rate goes up. Uh, we had a bad flu epidemic about a decade ago. I know AIDS back in 1993 you know, caused a one-year uptick. This one is a little bit more complicated, uh, and we review what went on there. Uh, part of it was a worsening of the opioid addiction problem, uh, and it, uh, it is spreading, it is getting worse, it's involving all age brackets, and if any of you have questions about kind of which generation is implicated in all this uh, or where this opioid epidemic comes from, we can certainly talk about that. Um, the, uh, but just to give you some point of reference, about two or three years ago, uh, uh, what, what the CDC or what the uh, uh, what the, what the vital statistics people call poisonings, uh, which is, includes all forms, mostly all forms of accidental drug uh, uh, ingestion, uh, exceeded for the first time traffic fatalities as the number one cause of accidental death. Um, the other cause was uh, boomers aging badly. Uh, we have uh, a plateauing, in some cases a slight increasing this last year of heart disease on an age-adjusted basis. And a lot of that has to do with, and we can talk about that again, it has to do with uh, 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 chronic disease and disabilities and how well uh, this new generation that's moving past age 60 is taking care of itself. Secondly, just to quickly overview, fertility. Fertility rate actually went up slightly in 2014. Everyone is happy. We thought this was the end of the recession, right? I mean, suddenly we had a little tempo effect, there was a little bit of rebound, maybe the economy was picking up. And most people expect that it would continue to go up at least slightly in 2015. In fact, the most respected, uh, in my opinion, the, the, the most competent uh, group of forecasters out there is demographic intelligence in Charlottesville, Virginia. We actually do some things together. Uh, uh, actually predicted that there was going to be a slight uptick. Well, that, that didn't happen. <laughs> it, was, it went down. It went down by 1%. One, 1%. Uh, what's behind that, uh, just to keep this short, uh, is the, clearly the continued impact of low median income growth on typical families. And remember, and I have to remind people about this, it's not the average income growth or even median across all age brackets. It's the age brackets that are responsible for giving kids. Mm -hmm. So you're looking from people in their late 20s to people about age 40. So this is the very early wave of millennials and late wave Xers. They've been hammered by the economy and their median income is not growing as fast as people in their 50s, 60s, and 70s, right? They have huge amounts of uh, uh, debt they're trying to get out from under and so on. So they're burdened. The other impact is millennials, good economy or a bad economy, they are simply having kids later. Uh, they are very risk averse. That We have a record low of unplanned pregnancies. And there is one very interesting chart you'll see in our piece, which shows the enormous decline of fertility among teens and early 20s. The big increase, actually, to some extent, partly compensating for that, is a large increase uh, in moms in their 30s. So it's really Gen Xers having kids later thus far has been somewhat compensating for that earlier decline. I wanted to keep it short. Okay. You know? And, yeah, I got, a, uh, I got a ton of questions. I mean, there's a lot of questions okay. in the queue here. I'll hit on a couple, but I'd just be. Do you think on the birth decline, 
Um, you know, a lot of that looked like when I was looking at this data recently for this work we're doing on a couple of companies. You know, it's a big piece of hospital revenue. It's a big piece of a couple of companies that face that that uh, issue of births. A big piece of the healthcare economy. But a lot of uh, pre, like teen births and like this teen pregnancy issue really, and then the immigrant issue that the, the a lot of Latinos are having uh, fewer kids per capita uh, compared to prior you know five year segments or ten year segments. The biggest decline uh, in kind of subpopulations is under age 30 immigrant Hispanic. Hmm. That's been catastrophic decline. Uh, and, and for the same reason, we've had a lot less illegal immigration, right? I mean, that's, you know, there's the two are related. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, this, this, the economy is not as welcoming to immigrants. Uh, obviously, for several years in construction and so on. Also, I would argue that uh, the you know there's for complicated demographic reasons, but families are now smaller in Latin America. There just isn't the same mm -hmm. economic gradient that there used to be. Uh, but yes, that's a big deal. I think the interesting thing to think about from a kind of uh, uh, market perspective is the fact that although there are fewer births, you're having m a more older birth, born births to mm -hmm. older families. Um, uh, who are more affluent, right? Uh, they are more set up in their families and so on. Uh, they're not, you know, teens or early 20s, right. you know. Um, uh, they have a lot of fa extra family support, you know, with, uh, with extended family. Uh, and there is now, you know, we're talking about this new kind of Gen X parent era. There is an enormous amount of emphasis on doing everything right with your child, right? Whether it's making sure you save your cord blood, and you know what I'm mm -hmm. talking about, all the stuff yeah. you do. I mean, there might be a little bit of backlash. I mean, I have a couple <laughs> of young kids. But, <laughs> okay, yeah. but my point is, is that yeah. there's a, a lot of these parents today, I think a little bit of it's their own backlash from the way they were raised, spend fulsomely on their kids. Even yeah, no, they no, no, no seat belts in the back of the station wagon when I was, when I was little. I, I'm well aware of yeah. that, right. But how many times do I interview parents today and they say they're deliberately not raising their kids like they were raised? Right. They're going to give their kids everything. And so very often that means a lot of products which have high profit margins or health service at high profit margins simply because they're told, if you really want the best, mm -hmm. do it this way. And they'll say, yeah, I want the best. Right. Right. Has anybody done any good survey work on attitudes towards pregnancy, family formation amongst these younger cohorts? Uh, yeah. I mean, there's a, what, what kind of particular well, I just, kind of thing you know, you're, you're in it. People can delay for all sorts of reasons. You know, 30s are your, you know, are your 20s prior to, compared to prior uh, generations where you would buy your house much younger, you would get married much younger, have your first kid, all this all this stuff, and, and so the attitudinal changes, I wonder if that's the permanent you know, birth per capita that we're seeing slow down in some, in some extent. Um, you know, it's interesting. One of the things when we talk to millennials and we survey them, they actually have very long-term time horizons. They're doing everything they can to plan things, mm -hmm. right? As opposed to those of us who were older, we came of age, hey, we're just gonna wing it. You know, somehow it'll all work out. Uh, so we find, for instance, a real popularity among benefits of, you know, freezing your eggs and do various things and I can have it late, you know, planning in advance. Well, if I can't have them now, you know, I'll have them later. Um, now, I don't know if that's going to work. We actually don't know much about how well that right. actually works in practice. But I think the attitude is you have to plan. And a lot of millennials out there are, are anxious. I mean, it's one of the big stressors in their lives, the fact that they think they have to plan. They know that they, you know, that they can't wait indefinitely to have kids, uh, but they feel they can't afford them yet to have them, mm -hmm. you know, to, 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 to be able to care for them yet. Okay. Um, All right, so uh, on the queue here, how, how long do you think this birth headwind will last uh, once the millennials, millennial bulge, bulge moves into the 30 to 35 year bracket? Uh, won't we see a re-acceleration? But again, I guess the answer to that is we're already seeing that age cohort accelerate. Yeah, we, we're going to see, in ter let me put it this way, in there are two ways demographers men uh, measure birth rates. One is just what's called the uh, kind of gross fertility rate or general fertility rate, which is just, you know, age, you know, 18 to 45, you know, just how many births per number of women. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't account for the fact that you may have a lot of women in the particularly, you know, fertile years, like, you know, mid-20s, late-20s. Uh, the other way they measure it is total fertility rate, and that's completely age-adjusted. 
So it's total fertility rate simply measures behavior. Okay, so it's 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 unweighted by age. I would say unweighted by age, we may not see much of a rise absent changes in sort of overall outlook for the economy or political system, sort of outlook on the world, uh, kind of a changing cultural uh, uh, outlook. Uh, but in terms of births, we will definitely see resurge in the number, uh, resurgence in the number of births because we have those huge cohorts born in 1990 and 1991 that are now age 25 and 26, right? They're going to be moving into their very high fertility years. So again, short answer to your question is the number of births will certainly go up over the next, you know, between five and 10 years, uh, will certainly rise. But the actual total fertility rate, which is how we measure behavior at every age, right. may not rise much yeah, at all. It could be flatter even yeah. further, further down from here. And just on, in the slides that are on hedgeye.com for this, uh, I noticed that there was, you know, could you true up the comment that you made about risk aversion and sort of the savings and, you know, the savings rates of these younger cohorts? Because they look financially, like you said, much more stressed. But that doesn't seem to me risk averse. Well, uh, let me give you one example. Um, when it comes to borrowing, uh, millennials in their current age, for instance, people in their late 20s, are borrowing less in every category of borrowing except for the big one, hmm. college, right? We all know college debt is astronomically. Right. They feel, millennials feel in their planning mode, in their kind of risk averse mode, they cannot afford not to borrow for right. that, right? But everything else is going down. Card debt is going down. Uh, credit card debt is going down. Mortgages are go mortgage debt is going down. In fact, the entire increase in credit, net credit, is over age 50. The boomers are still using their homes as credit cards. You know, I got that home equity loan. Need to bring a little more money up. It's an amazing. And there's a, I think it was uh, either in my housing presentation or a piece we did called uh, Millennials. Are we there yet? Uh, where we actually look at a curve of net borrowing, uh, you know, today versus 10 years ago. Yeah. And it's actually a deficit, you know, uh, all the way up until about age 50, and then it's a huge excess. So it's very interesting how we're inverting, you know, and I went to a, uh, a conference at the St. Louis Fed, this must have been about a year ago, a year and a half ago, and there's a lot of data there. Uh, we were all presenting different kinds of data, and interestingly, uh, delinquencies are down among people in the late 20s. Uh, you know, they, credit ratings are hugely important to millennials, much more important than they ever were to us. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that can be a relationship ending question for a dating couple today. What's your credit score? I mean, that could be it. Unfortunately, I missed that. I missed that. Uh, <laughs> I certainly missed when it. When I was too. growing up, it's not the question my, my wife would have asked me back in the day. Um, maybe she should have. Yeah, maybe she should have. So, uh, again, on, on, uh, are these post-general uh, fertility um, or GFC shifts in birth and mortality rates a U.S. phenomenon or is there a broader Western world experiencing something similar? Uh, the world has experienced something similar after 2008, 2009. Right. Yeah, and we I guess the, the, the corollary here is the, the graying of the great powers. Right. So I guess the well, GDP would be the I mean, it, output, I guess. Yeah, it's very interesting. There actually was a little bit of a baby boomlet or a resurgence. You know, a lot of, uh, you know, Western Europe and Japan, obviously East Asia, but particularly in Western Europe, we saw this constant decline, yeah. late 60s, 70s, 80s, and they didn't have the millennial resurgence in the birth rate that we had in the late 70s, early 80s, you know, when you saw that fertility rate come. They kept declining. They did, though, have a resurgence in the early OOs between the very end of the 1990s and a lot of these countries like France, particularly in Northern Europe, had a real climb back up. Um, and that has come down again, obviously, post 2008. So they're down again, um, and we see the same thing there. And it, it's down, it's stayed down. It really hasn't come. I mean, Europe obviously has, not, has done worse than we have in terms of you know, mm -hmm. household standard of living and unemployment. So. Okay. Um. And I should just add too, uh, just just in case, uh, this may be some some viewers may understand this, but but just to keep this in perspective, the the U.S. fertility rate, though though now we're under replacement, we're down at you know 1.8 something, uh, we are still uh, among the best, uh, if not the best, in the entire 
high income world. So almost every other high income country is lower than we are. Mm -hmm. Possible exception now of, of France and so on. A couple of these countries now have, have, have retained enough, have gone back up high enough. France, obviously, because of their history and constantly trying to outpopulate the Germans <laughs> ever since Napoleon, and then ever since the Franco-Prussian War, they'd be, how do we get our birth rate up to compete with the Germans? So France has developed over the decades an enormously elaborate and generous system of, of child subsidies, including, this is interesting, the benefit you get actually goes up with each subsequent child. Oh, so it's actually a- Encouraging, yeah. Yeah, it actually gives you more for your second than your first, more for your third yeah. than your I second. I had a very good friend who left Brooklyn and went back home basically to Paris. For that to very have reason, another child. To have his, no, to have his kids, to have, start <laughs> yeah. his family. Um, so touching on this mortality uh, issue of that basing and sort of picking up, uh, do you think the mortality rate increase will cause some kind of government initiatives spurring healthcare spending. I know we've heard a lot about opiate addiction uh, in the press lately. You know, what, what's, your, what's your thought there about government initiatives? Well, you know, I'll be honest here. Uh, uh, I'm, uh, I am uh, very disappointed, I think, in uh, the the uh, reaction of the medical profession as a profession mm -hmm. in its response to this. Because it is doctors as a group which got us into this problem. Right. Uh, if you go back 15 or 20 years ago, the only time opioids were ever prescribed was in, in extremis, I mean terminally ill patients right. and right. so on. Now you go in, I don't know if you've noticed, but you know, over the past five years, you go in and have your filling drilled on yeah, your yeah. tooth. They give you Percocet and Vicodan yep. and stuff. This is, to me, a complete abdication of the responsibility, the Hippocratic Oath, and anything else that doctors mm -hmm. are supposed to do. And they caused this. And, and most of the heroin well, they were they were accused for a long time of under-medicating pain relative to the rest of the world. That was, I remember that I would, was the call I would all rather, through the 90s I would and rather under-medicate pain yeah. than to cause a problem like this. And the... Uh, most of the heroin problem we have in this country now is actually people seeking replacement yeah. for they run prescription. Out of scripts. Yeah, yeah, they run on prescription. Uh, this is not like, you know, in the in the late seventies with with uh, or the early seventies with Janis Joplin and all the mm -hmm. you know the earlier heroin use was just pure youthful risk taking and experimentation. Now it really is people searching for replacements for prescription. Yeah, self medicating. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, is millennial risk averse nature something seen globally? Uh, to some extent it is, and actually we are in touch with a number of researchers on millennials around the world. Um, I, uh, in, uh, let's say, let's say Holland, Netherlands, Poland, uh, Germany, as well as China. Uh, and many of the same qualities are being seen, you know, the, the specialness, the conventionality, the, the family closeness, uh, the renewed respect for national institutions, which is actually feeding a little bit this new nationalism we're seeing around the world. We see in Europe now, you know, the kids wrapping themselves in their country's flags hmm. uh, in Olympics or sporting events. 15 years ago, 10 years ago even, they right. never did that, right? So th these are changes we're seeing. And, but I would say particularly on the risk aversion, uh, uh, yes, and a good example of that, I actually did a um, uh, about everything piece on this. It might have been even the first piece I did here, and it was, uh, it was on the decline in drinking establishments, uh, hmm. not only in the United States, but in Western Europe. Discotheques are completely going out, uh, and, and they're commenting as widely in the United Kingdom, the decline in, in kind of binge drinking among kids and the decline in kids actually drinking out. We know they got, uh, they got Facebook and Tinder and a million other ways to get in touch with each other, uh, touch with e each other rather than going into a dark bar. Right. You can't take selfies in a bar anyway, so you know it's kind of dark in there. But, but my point is, is that is that we do see this. We do see this uh, declining rates of uh, you know smoking is now going down. Uh, alcohol, severe alcohol abuse is going down. Uh, vehicular accidents and none of, the, none of the things we've seen here. I will say that in Europe we see it with a lag, so it's happening about five to ten years later, but we have always maintained that generational divides in Europe are a little bit later than they are here. It does sort of seem though across a lot of these topics though, that there's a big split between like there's the extreme of risk aversion and 
the abdication responsibility by some somebody like the AMA on this opiate addiction, which leads to a lot of very risky behavior and unhealthy behavior. And the same with uh, immigration. You know, we have this really crazy immigration policy and, and discussion going on, but it's a clearly a really good thing for the country. It's really a, a, a positive. Uh, a positive element that should be addressed in a very rational way, and sort of, again, the, the institutions that are on top of all this stuff seem to not really either get it or, you know, are, are not implementing or doing something about it in, in real terms. So I'd be curious, I mean, I don't want to wade into any uncharted waters, but what do you make of sort of the political environment that we're in now, and, and sort of how do you match up, you know, this millennial attitude of do your job, risk aversion, like let's take care, like a more of a socialist vibe, I'd, I'd right. say, on that on that end, versus like what we're seeing today in, on TV. Well, I think I think the 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 kind of the center of gravity of sort of the libertarian spirit, you know, lock and load, get government out of my life, is moving up the age ladder. You yeah, know? it's aging with boomers, aging a little bit with Xers, um, and you know, millennials are fine with a group. And we have done, I don't know how many surveys on this. Uh, we've done them for the Republican Party. We've done them for a lot of people in we're, we're based in Washington. Um, and the, just one characteristic question to answer your chance, it may just sum up kind of what you're getting at here. We ask people of all ages, what do you prefer? The government should reinforce the principle of community. Government should reinforce the principle of self-reliance. Boomers split 50-50 on that question. Millennials, it's like 75-25. In favor and, of community. In favor of community. Yeah. And by the way, it's a bigger gap among Republican millennials as Democrats. It's not even a partisan gap. We, we interviewed the, the, the millennial Republicans. It's, 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 a, it's as big a gap. The difference is, is that with Republican boomers, it's like, you know, <laughs> 70, 30, right, self-reliance. Mm -hmm. But you have the same gap when you move well, They're also the past the period in their, their time, their lifespan, where that's an interesting and relevant point, right? If they've already had a career, they've already bought a house, they've already, you know, they're sort of, they're less reliant on the community That's by true, but if you had gone back at the same age and interviewed members of the GI generation who had fought in World War II, voted for the New Deal, got their social, you know what I mean, mm -hmm. and really, stood up for people who stood up for the system. I don't think you would have gotten that answer. That's a good line, I like that. What? Stood up for people who stood up for the system. That's well, a, I mean, that's they a nice, that's a, that's, a, that's a rallying comment. But I think too, on your comment about you know votes on immigration and so on, we actually had a discussion this morning with Keith on that regarding Brexit, um, you know, regarding discussing immigration rationally. When it comes to who you let into your community, or even more with regard to the relationship between Britain and the EU, questions of just basic sovereignty. Who's in control of yeah, my community? Yeah, yeah. That's not a rational question, right? That goes to very much deeper parts of the brain, right? And we don't look at that in terms of cost-benefit analysis. We look at that in terms of, should we fight a war over this? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I think that that's where I think there's a complete miscommunication. Well, there's so many intangibles associated with that you can't really link to your own personal experience, but it, you have this kind of visceral reaction to it. And it's, we all do. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, let me see if there's any, one more question here I think we have time for. Um, Let's see, as, as boomers age and begin to die off at an accelerating rate, do you have any insight on whether there would be a higher mix of cremations versus standard funeral, funeral or burial? And do they have a preference? I remember I did a lot of work on this when I covered, uh, when I was looking at Hill Rom and Batesville Casket Company. It was my introduction to demographics. Batesville. Batesville. They're, not in, they're not in like Indiana? In, right? Indiana, Batesville, Indiana. The, I, I went, yeah, yeah. I, I actually consulted for them once. Yeah. There was the only time. It's a very my, predictable curve. The totally, curve. it is, and it's the only time. And you know, I, I'm often asked to consult on different generational trends mm -hmm. and so on. And it's the only time in my life that I ever was asked to talk to a group about the lost generation. Hmm. <laughs> they still had. When I went out there, it was like 15 years ago. They still had people in their late 90s who yeah. were like lost, yeah. you know, World War One veterans. Mm -hmm. um, uh, 
the answer is yes. I mean, uh, cremations are obviously becoming much more popular. I think one of the things that's, that's very clear among, this is kind of the aging of new age, you know, as, as boomers get older, and that is to use their death as a statement, you know, a statement of their life and their moral principles of who they are. In other words, to have their ashes down and you know to help to you know down down to help to uh, build up a coral reef you know that's that's getting wasted by global warming or to or to fly them up in a spaceship along with a CD about their life or something wow. you know what I mean I mean the no. idea of, <laughs> I don't I you don't heard know that. what you mean well no I mean I've heard these I mean <laughs> yeah but the, yeah or or, or, or or monumenting in some way yeah using that as a way to pass your message on maybe you to kids and your family um, I think. Uh, uh, obviously, more cremation, uh, and but doing it more in a cre I think the money to be made is not so much in, as they used to be in kind of what you do with a body, right. but rather what do you do as a statement around that? Oh, act, sure. Right? Like there's a there's a there's the <coughs> online experience for for mourners. Totally. There's the, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's very common. All right. Well, I think that's I think that's all we have time for today. Um, thanks for joining us, uh, Neil and I, talking about uh, about everything, and uh, right. we'll see you next week.